number one, we're very excited to have you here today. Thank I'll, you. I'll start Jed. off like that. The one and only Maxime Shaya. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and uh, it seems like everyone has a Maxime story. Mm -hmm. And when yeah. I said... Okay, everyone has a Maxime story, but you know what my, my, my motto is? There's an Everest for everyone. And I guess you guys doing this, you will. Uh, maybe you're not at your Everest now, but you will get there. I, I We're on the journey. We're on like the first uh, base, base, camp, camp, base, camp. base camp. Before you even get to Everest. Yeah. <laughs> when the you're first having mountain. Hot chocolate. <laughs> doing the prep work. Exactly, <laughs> eating a pizza. It's not even Everest. It's like a mountain, like three mountains before deciding to hike exactly, Everest. Exactly. I think, I think that's, that's where we're about right now. And when I was telling the guys, okay, we're going to get Maxime and it's going to be a great one. He's had such a life story and he's had such a career. And then Joe told me something. Uh, My dad he told me he used to go up to the Cedars a lot. And he would tell me that when he would go in the morning, he would see you biking up to the Cedars. Then let's say he's going back down in the afternoon. You would be going down with the bike on your back <laughs> and just like jogging down from no. the fucking Cedars. Uh, <laughs> maybe the up thing would be correct, but biking, but running down with a bike on your back. I don't know. I don't I'd put it past you, though. Yeah. That's the thing. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised after well, everything you've Not you've on the road. I mean, off-road, you might have to carry the bike sometimes, and I've done that many times because sometimes the terrain is unrideable. But I guess on the road, unless you have a flat and you don't happen to have your your kit with you to, mm. to, to, to repair a flat, which is... Anyway. But, it, um, yeah, so everyone seems to have some sort of crazy story. I, like, wh when, you're, when you're a child, are you this crazy physical monster that's able to do these <laughs> these things of marvel apparently not i was a goody two shoes um, <laughs> um like uh, but but my teacher at the lycée at the lycée franco libanais i remember she was pregnant she was a very nice and she loved me very much but she used to tie me to my desk because i was so agitated so often the bell would ring and i would beg her to release me so i can go and <laughs> yeah so i can go and run and jump on things and go crazy but as a kid you were never like you never be fond of just going out into nature exploring going to adventures oh for sure yeah um i would i would love nature i also loved biking with my dad and uh Tari abu dhahab at the time who used to bike all up uh, up to Su al Gharib or Alay where oh, we so lived <laughs> we, have, we have a fellow Su al Gharib uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i Beautiful also area. I also remember vividly, and it's actually in my book. I think it was 68. When was the first landing on the moon? 69. 69? 69. 69. 69 was it? Yes. It was 1969. Uh, we were watching it on a black and white TV screen, uh, and my dad and my uncle, who's my godfather, were playing pool. And I, and I said, wow, that would be amazing, you know, walking on the moon one day. And my, my uncle innocently said, well, Max, it's a bit far-fetched because you need a huge budget, but the closest you can get to the moon is the summit of Mount Everest, which is the highest um, thing uh, mountain on Earth. And at the time, it's just stuck in my mind, and I thought I would love to see Mount Everest, let alone attempt to climb it. Yeah, because that's the thing. It, it wasn't very apparent for you reading up on you. You didn't, you know have the typical mountaineering adventure career. I mean, you went to LSE and then you work, came back here and you started to work at your family company, which was a foreign exchange office. Am I, am I correct in saying that? Correct. So I just wanted to know, was there a moment of, you know, respectfully, fuck this shit, there's more to life. I need to, <laughs> I need to pursue something that I'm passionate about or how did that moment come to you? Let's look, it's a good question. Um, <coughs> Definitely, I was a goody two-shoes, like I said. I went to school, I got an honors degree from LSE, and I worked hard. But there came a time, actually after LSE, I went to New York, and I worked at the Republic National Bank, and I would always sit in the trading room and look outside. There was the public uh, library um, uh, gardens just below us. And I would always think, what am I doing here, sitting in front of screens with numbers? What am I achieving? What am I? What good am I doing to the planet? And I thought you're um, making other people richer. <laughs> that, that's but if these people are, are are helping with education, with I don't know the environment or something, that would be good. But at the time, I thought this is not what I really <laughs> wa want to be. But it took some time for me to get my sh shit together. together <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> word. <laughs> yeah. Um, in order to do this and not have my family suffer from it. By the time I decided to climb the seven summits, I was already married with two kids, responsibilities. And it's not like I, you know, 
I inherited millions to be able to do this without, uh, you know, um, getting my ducks into line uh, before setting off. And when you say without kind of stepping on the toes of your family, was that from like a legacy perspective or a monetary or continuing the family business? H- how would they have inter- no, Definitely not the leg- legacy or the family business, but you know, uh, I needed to feed uh, um, my wife and kids and the cat and, the, and, and pay the bills. Um, and also need, I needed to spend uh, the reasonable amount of time with my family. And I believe, and I honestly believe I've done that because I, 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 I had a lot of, I made a lot of sacrifices, but none at the expense of my family. I was, I was not able to see my friends as much as I would have liked to, or hang around, or have a drink, or, or, or but um, I would have breakfast and dinner with my kids uh, all the time. Maybe the only one who really paid the price was my wife, my ex-wife now, um, <coughs> with whom I have great relations, but um, maybe she wanted that other lifestyle that most Lebanese, as you know, mm. live. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It must have been hard doing all of these like extreme things, climbing mountains, tr- crossing oceans, and having the thought that, yeah, I have to stay alive. There's a family that needs me when I come back. You look, it was, uh, it was, it was a double-edged sword, uh, or, or it was good and bad. It was good in the fact that, yes, I had to remember that. Uh, I was sorry, it was bad that, uh, in the fact that, yes, there is a possibility that I wouldn't come back. Because okay. it's dangerous. Everything that you did is dangerous well, stuff. Dangerous is a very. Well, let me get into that later. Life dangerous. is da- day to day. Life is dangerous. <laughs> like yeah, uh, just breathing Lebanese yeah. air is dangerous. <laughs> dangerous. I'm writing in my new book. <laughs> um, but um, so so. But at the same time, it made me realize that nothing is more important than my life. Not because I'm worried about my life. If I was to die tomorrow, I'd be happy because I've achieved um, as much as I would have l- would have hoped or or dreamed of achieving. However. I have a family to take care of, and uh, I wouldn't want my kids to grow up. Now they've they've grown up; mm. they're 26 and 24, and they're, they're almost you know independent. Uh, but at the time, I wouldn't want I wouldn't have wanted them to grow up without a father, simply because I somewhere was maybe a bit selfish in pursuing my grand adventure dreams. But do you think do you think to to reach uh, you know, no pun intended, the summits that you've reached and the level you've gone to, you probably do need to sacrifice family and friends because there comes a point, I think, to get that level of training and dedication where I think it would be impossible to, you know, measure in between the two. I think you'd need to set your life to training and, and working and even fixing your mentality to achieve the things you've achieved. Beyond the training and fixing the mentality, it's the preparation. It takes uh, it takes not weeks, not months, but years to prepare adventures. As you know, uh, the Indi- uh, Rio rowing across the Indian Ocean took three years in the making. That's uh, crazy, the same with ways. Brack biking Rob Al Khali. Um, but like I said, uh, we all have 24 hours a day, seven days in a week. Real. And do you ever feel that when you come back, let's say you went and you hiked, you went on a hike on Everest, when you come back, do you hike and Everest. Not yeah. hike, like maybe you, you climb, you <laughs> climb. Yes, I meant, I meant to say climb, climb Mount Everest, and then you come back to your day-to-day normal life within, not just Lebanese society, human society. Don't you feel as if there's some kind of like boredom to everyday life compared to going out on adventures? Uh, look, it's it's um, it's normal that you might think um, like that, but um, you know the the saying in Arabic, "El jenne balanes maptendes," so. I always say the summit is only half the journey, okay? And uh, you still have to come back down. And in terms of dangerousness, and I'll go back to your point of on danger and, and your point on extreme later, but in terms of dangerous, it's, lo- it's a lot more dangerous to return from the summit of Everest than it is to make it up there, simply because, well, of course, you have, you have, you have gravity working um, against you and in, 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 a, in, a, in a negative and way should you. something happen. <laughs> But more importantly, if you think that the top, at the top you've made it and you let go of your physical or mental abilities, then this is where uh, shit might happen and you might not return to base safely. So you always have to stay focused and, uh, and, 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 and determined and alert on the way back from the summit of Everest. 
just to come back to the dangerous and the extreme, these are words that are very elastic. Let me give you an example. OK, I studied economics, but if I was to go into an operating room and, uh, and cut a patient's, uh, an open heart operation, if I was to try that on a patient, I would, it, it's safe to say that I would kill the patient. Yeah, you okay. and I both. But, but does yeah. it exactly think everyone in this room us, would? All of us, yes. But does it mean that anyone who walks into, uh, um, uh, uh, who, who does that would kill the patient? Of course not. No, we have, because we have he's heart trained. surgeons. Yeah. yeah. And they've, they've studied and they have the experience and, and the knowledge and the wisdom, may I say, to, you know, the same with Formula One driving. If I was to hop into a Formula One car, I probably would kill myself before finishing the first lap. But does it mean that anyone who hops into. So, so dangerous and, and, and extreme are very. Different words. Uh, not different. different. They're more or less the same, but, they, but, but you, can you can interpret them in, in different ways. If I had not climbed the other seven summits before attempting Everest, maybe that would have, that been, would have been dangerous, dangerous and super uh, extreme and maybe stupid. My tent mate on Everest, Gérard Bourat, um, not only did he not make it to the summit, but he lost 16 fingers and toes. Okay? And I believe because Gérard, although he's an amazing guy, he's dead now, uh, did not have the the experience or the qualifications or the, 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 the knowledge necessary to attempt to climb Everest. Wow. And I would add to that the wisdom to turn around and come back on time in order not to uh, suffer what he suffered. Because you spoke about knowledge and wisdom and preparation, Tab. What does it take? And we'll get on to the seven summits, but... First off, for somebody who doesn't even know what the seven summits are, for instance, I'm quite basic in my knowledge. I know that uh, there's an Everest in there, there's a <coughs> Kilimanjaro, I'm guessing, Look, but what the are the, the other? The seven summits are quite simply the highest peak on each continent. So, of course, the highest is Everest, which is also the highest in the world. Yeah. But if you go Africa, it's Kilimanjaro. If you go America, well, North America, it's Denali. It used to be called, uh, sorry, it used to be called Mount McKinley, but it's no longer, it's called Denali. South America, it's Aconcagua. And this is also the highest summit in the Western Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere. It's also the highest summit in the world outside of Asia, all our big mountains. There are 14 8,000 meter peaks, they're all in Asia. Okay, and all of these are bigger than the rest of the seven summits, bar Everest. Okay, where were we? Now we go Antarctica, which is a continent on its own. Highest peak is Vinson. Then we go Europe, the highest peak is Elbrus in the Caucasus. And Finally, there's a little dispute regarding the seventh summit. Some people think it should be on the Australian mainland, and that's Kosciusko, just 2,200 meters. Others think we should include Indonesia, which would make the Karstens Pyramid 4,884 meters the seventh summit. Mm. Wow, that was like a... Geography lesson. That was a like geography lesson, but yeah. Efficient, concise, <laughs> like it. Straight to the point, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But... So you were talking about right now, yeah, the mental preparation, and uh, let's take it back to the first time you had to, the first time you went on a climb to one of the seven, to the first, which was the first summit that you went up and you went up on. Well, in that comic strip that I will be offering yeah. you guys, yeah. <laughs> um, um, it's Kilimanjaro. This is yeah. Kili, yeah. and I climbed it simply because after winning a bike race, well, you'll read in the story, I was yeah. invited to climb it, and mm -hmm. I discovered the high mountain, and more importantly, myself on Kili. And it was coming back from Kilimanjaro that I uh, understood this was one of the infamous or famous mm. seven summits. And that at the time, there was only 54 people who had climbed them. And I thought, Max, maybe this is your chance to prove to yourself that had you grown up in a normal country with no war, no, uh, maybe you could have achieved your ambition of becoming a, a, a professional athlete. So I did this to prove to myself that. And also, uh, I wanted in my own little way to show a different face of Lebanon because <laughs> sadly, every time I saw my country on the news, it was bad news and it was you know, killing and hatred and destruction. Especially at that time during the civil war. And uh, as you said, so when you, went up, when you went up Kilimanjaro the first time, was it like, did you prepare physically or was it more of a mental challenge or a physical challenge for you going up? Well, look, like I said, I climbed Kili after winning yeah. an, uh, an international mountain bike stage race on the Kenyan plateau. Yeah. So I was like, um, I'd been training for quite a bit. Yeah. The, th the story is that in the year uh, 2000, I was leading that race and I fell and I dislocated my collarbone. I had to abandon the race and come back home for surgery. 
And to cut a long story short, I decided to go back to Africa the next year. It's a, it was an annual mm. international race for some unfinished business there. So I went back there and I won the race and then I was invited. So in answer to your question, I was already very, very fit and I'd been racing for a week on the plateau. So, so for me, actually it was only me and the winner of the running race because there was a biking race mm -hmm. and a, a running race. race. It was only me and um, I think it was Stefan, a French guy who had won the, the French race, who made it to the summit because uh, there was a storm on, 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 on summit day. So, but I, I honestly discovered myself and I saw that I was capable of a lot more than I thought I did. And this is one of my major messages to um, kids when I go to schools and address them. I tell them that I know none of you, but I'm convinced that all of you underestimate yourselves. You have a lot more potential than you think you do. And if you put your mind to it, there's nothing you cannot achieve. Of course, there will be sacrifices along the way. Of course, there will be storms along the way. Of course, there'll be obstacles along the way. But obstacles were made for us to break yeah. through them and go and achieve our goals, aren't they? And I agree with you, like, especially after achieving, like, let's say you set your mind towards achieving like a really high goal. It's up until you achieve like the first step of that goal where you start looking at yourself and be like, oh, I can actually, like, there is potential in me. And another thing I remember me and the guys were talking about a few days ago was, like, the impact of climate change in general on the world. And have you felt, just by because most of your adventures are out in nature, have you had, like, first-hand experiences by seeing the effects of climate change on Earth, especially when you go out to these wild places over the past 20 years? Mm -hmm. Well, listen, uh, I definitely experienced this firsthand in 2009, March and April 2009, when I skied to the North Pole. We set off from the extreme north of Canada, Ward Hunt Island, and we skied north to 90 degrees north, the geographical North Pole. Now, besides the fact that it was extremely cold when we set off on the 3rd of March because the sun was not above the horizon yet at the time, and when you're close to the mainland, it's a lot colder than when you're out on, on the ice far from the mainland because you know, unlike the South Pole, the North Pole is above the Arctic Ocean. South Pole is a continent. And uh, the ocean, okay, the water is always very cold, but it doesn't go colder than minus two or minus three degrees, otherwise it freezes. So you have a warm, uh, a big warm thing underneath the ice. So it's not that, it's very, very uh, humid, which makes it even worse, which makes ma that the cold a lot worse than the dry cold of Antarctica. But um, to get to my point, I did see the effects of climate change and global warming on my way to the North Pole in 2009. We had to swim across open leads. You see, the ice is um, dynamic. And because of the wind, the current, and the rotation of the Earth, that ice sometimes breaks up. It may break up and open, which is what we call an open lead, and it takes two, three days for it to freeze again up to eight centimeters for it to support our weights and the weight of our sleds. Or it breaks up and it crushes and it creates what we call uh, pressure ridges, which are blocks of ice that are, you know, there as though a, a gigantic crane. So uh, the, the forces involved are humongous. The, the noises we hear sometimes at night uh, while in the tent is, is, is undescribable. So it's either this or that. Now, sometimes we were able to wait until uh, the, the, the water froze for us to be able to, and sometimes we simply had to put on our dry suits and swim across uh, the open leads. So definitely there's something called uh, global warming. So from someone who's seen it first time, because it, it still amazes me today how there's some massive media publications, especially now with social media, who still deny global warming and still say it's a myth and climate change is not happening and uh, this is uh, there's a political agenda to climate change because there's also the economical factor behind it and it's good that someone who's seen it firsthand can yeah, it doesn't need someone like me i'm not a scientist but it is a fact that yeah. I mean, you look, look at the figures you yeah. see the Just temperature rise a degree every look year at it right now but people still deny it, that's what i'm saying we're in november we're in november right now sorry we're in november right now in lebanon we're all in short sleeves mm. and shorts, like I'm, I'm sure 20 years ago, November. Look, that, that can happen. I mean, I'm, I'm not a scientist again, but I mean, for, for, for all those skeptics, and of course, there's, there has to be skeptics. That th they give you credibility. I mean, as long as, but, but go and look at the, the glaciers in the Alps. Yeah. 
how they're retreating from year to year. You look at the picture from just 50 years ago and the picture from today, you won't believe it's the same place. It's the same valley, but the ice has retreated hundreds of meters. Even the amount of ice that's melting in the Arctic and the Antarctica, the amount of ice that's melting, I'm hearing that if the ice continues to melt at this rate within the next 20 years, ocean levels are going to rise by a certain percentage. Well, Antarctica is 98% covered with ice. Yeah. Okay. And that ice is very, very thick. At the South Pole proper, uh, actually, the South Pole is only 3,000 meters. But at its thickest, it is 4,800 meters thick of ice. The ice. Yeah. That wow. is fresh water. We're not going to go into why it's fresh water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Please tell us why it's fresh water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially that Antarctica is the highest, coldest, and driest continent on Earth. Th th there is no precipitation. But to come to your point, if all of the ice in Antarctica was to melt, we might be underwater here even on the ninth floor because our Actually, no, we wouldn't be. Because our seas and oceans would rise by 50 to 60 meters. Can you imagine the havoc wow. that would cause? We'll, we'll have to put a diving board. The port board. of Beirut will <laughs> no longer be, be there. It would be Waterworld. Have you watched that movie, Waterworld? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd be Kevin Costner and we'd all be trying to live with you. <laughs> you're, no, you're more the one who looks like Kevin yeah, Costner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't have the skills of Kevin Costner <laughs> in Waterworld. Well, that's why Elon Musk wants to fuck off to Mars. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mars, here we come. Um, so what... Because I've always been curious. I know you're someone who's conquered literally everything. But conquered? I would you say don't I conquer the mountain. You conquer yourself on the mountain. Yeah, because everyone That's talks Sir Edmund about Hillary. We, we had, we had a, a, a mountaineer called Rami Rassamni. <laughs> Rayan. Called who? Rami Rassamni. Have you heard of him? Rami Rassamni? He's, he's fun. Life happens outdoors. Life happens outdoors. He's a mountaineer. No, but yeah. And he was very um, kind of philosophical and and i've and i've always wondered is this kind of just a shtick that people say like you conquer yourself on the mountain and the mountain is just no. a metaphor but is that actual is it an internal feeling when you get to the top or when you you know achieve one of these these amazing feats of course it's an internal feeling and of course it's a great joy and and, and satisfaction and the tougher the challenge the greater the reward but uh, you learn from being outdoors especially as m someone who's been outdoors as much as i have that <coughs> the mountain or nature is way, 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 way bigger than all of us put together. So when you say I conquered the mountain, <laughs> you know, the, like I wrote in, in my other book, Steep Dreams, on chapter 8, Gasho Broom, which is the only summit that I failed because I decided to turn around and come back before I reached the summit. I wrote that the, in my journal on that day, it was uh, 2004, the mountain opens its arms to climbers every year and allows them to stand on the summit. But this year, that year, it wasn't to be, you know. Gasho Brum wanted to be left alone. And some of us understood it. I'd like to think that I understood it and I turned around and, 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 and I have no remorse whatsoever. But some of us didn't and I actually came back with a team of Spaniards. There were four. There were only three on the way back. So I replaced their, their uh, Jose who, who, who lost his life on the mountain. So in the to come back to your thing, nature is way, way, way bigger than all of us. I don't think it would be appropriate to say that a human conquers, conquers nature. It's not philosophical. I, as you can see, I'm, I'm, not a <laughs> I'm not a philosopher but by far, but <coughs> as you can see, I'm talking to you facts, and you know, every day uh, I'm answering your questions in a very simple way. It's not philosophical to say that you only conquer yourself on the mountain, I believe. And you mentioned someone, you know, this is, I think, the second story you mentioned someone losing their life on the mountain. Mm. What type of... No, I know we spoke about mental preparation and physical preparation, but was there ever a moment, because I have a very weak willpower, and when I'm put in a very stressful situation, I always tell myself, the preconceived notion I have is, oh, you're going to flop, you're going to fail, you're going you're gonna to have that negative mentality that's going to not get you there. Yeah, and I'm, I'm self-critical and a bit of a pessimist. Can you afford to be like that? If, to, to do the things you do, can you afford to have the mentality that I have? You're asking me if this question if I'm on the mountain. Yes, if you're... I'm going to answer you that you cannot afford to be like that, period. Why are you like this, Ryan? Uh, years of abuse. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he gave me that look like years of abuse. <laughs> no, and you know my dad quite well, so it's not. <laughs> it's not well, it could be your mom. I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, God that forbid. Make, probably that would make more sense. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And that's why I, I look 
a bit in awe at you as someone who's done these things. I mean, if I'm in the gym, I have a mentality that's saying, well, you're not going to be able to pick up the next weight. You're going to fail. If you get on that treadmill, you're going to slip. You're going to fall. So I, it's just mind boggling to me the things you do. And the mentality oh, you it's need mind to boggling have. to <laughs> me. <laughs> what I what do you think? Of why? I, I why? I always, Let me tell you how that. maybe you can start fixing that. Do your very best. Prepare for the worst, like they say, and hope for the best. Just prepare for the worst if, if th that's what you're doing anyway. You're not even preparing your bracing for the best. But just prepare for the best, for the worst. Sorry, bracing for the worst. Prepare for the worst, but, but do your very, very best. And then, Atufi and Allah. What I was trying to say is, is that when, on, on the many adventures you've been in, has there ever been a moment <coughs> where you, you did doubt yourself? You did say, no, I'm not going to make it. Or, no, yes, I might die. Or No, actually, no. And it's not because I'm different than anyone else, but why would you want to run these negative thoughts in your mind? Plus, if you prepare properly, and if you've, like we said, prepared for the worst, then why would you... Want to work And, and if you have the, and the, the experience not to lose a finger or a toe, and I was prepared to lose a finger or two to make it to the summit of Earth, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> That's fine. And I wasn't. <laughs> and I'm not. Why? I'm not prepared to slip at the gym. <laughs> Look at the difference. No, um... Um, actually, I was thinking about this just a few days ago, maybe yesterday, maybe the day before, how on October 15, when I did my Everesting, I had a huge problem, a rookie mistake, okay, and to cut a long story short, I really got dehydrated. I lost more than 6% of my body weight at hour 7 or 8, and I knew I had 12 or 13 hours to... And never in my mind, although my, 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 my cadence, so the speed at which I turn my, my, my legs, uh, the pedals, went down from 80 to 70 per minute, to 60, to 50, to 40, and below 40. And I remember my trainer who came late, well, who came uh, when he was supposed to come, like at midday, when he when he pinched my, my 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 skin like this and he saw that my skin would not return like it is now and he looked at my eyes and they were sunk in my head looked like a, a bird's head my, the skin on my legs looked like cellophane wrapped on my on my muscles he said max what have you done to yourself um anyway i'm not gonna go into the details but never in my mind although it is unheard of to s for someone to recover from such a dehydration while still on the bike I kept going and I actually improved at the end and I became stronger uh, and stronger towards the end and I finished in 13 hours. But I was thinking a few days ago, how did I not, how did the, ma the, the, the idea of, I was doing it for a charity, maybe that came into play and uh, there was a lot at stake. I mean, people had pledged money for the charity which needed the, those funds, but never in my mind did it, the, 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 the hint of maybe quitting uh, uh, cross. But you have to accept that you're not in the norm. You have to accept that most people in that situation... In, I your, mean, in that case, yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. But there's no reason whatsoever for you to doubt yourself on other things where it's not a matter of life and death. And like my take on these types of issues is that, as you said, like hope for the best, ex like expect, expect, yeah, sorry hope for the best, expect the worst. But like, if you know that, let's say the worst is over here and you're doing something, anything that you want to do in life, work your best to try to stay as far away as from the worst case situation. Like, that's how I approach everything. Like, if you know this is the worst case, stop thinking, oh my God, this is the worst case. Let me try as much as possible to divert away from that worst case situation. And well, yeah. Most of the things that we do are conscious decisions. Most of them. Unless like the things that happen, you know, through whatever forces that you cannot ca control. But when it's your conscious decision, that won't leave that. Like this, unless you know you get to a wall where you have to go around it, fine. But it's all still conscious decision. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I honestly. And you're yeah. way too tall to be afraid of shit, <laughs> man. Come on. It always comes back to my height. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll right, be like, yeah. my stomach would be hurting, and he'd be like, you're way too tall for your stomach. <laughs> it takes time. It takes time to go. Yeah, like it takes time for the. Uh, Pain Maybe that's why to process. is the air thinner up there? The air is, yeah. yeah. It yeah. makes you doubt yourself can more. Give you experience, our, our experience <laughs> on that. On thin air. On, 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 on thin, thin air, air exactly. <laughs> and um, so just to, to go back to some of your accolades, you have the seven summits. 
You have the three poles: North Pole, South Pole, Stripper Pole. What's the other pole? Yeah. The, the, there, are there three poles? No, I think there's no, two poles. I went to that one without even knowing. Yeah. <laughs> That that's when he conquered yeah, the yeah, 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 that was the most satisfying moment. <laughs> yeah. I think there's well, two poles. listen, after every poll comes a stripper poll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna quote but you on that. Yeah. I like that. Listen, poll. the third mm. poll is a good question. Everest is considered as a pole. Okay. Because it's like a pole on Earth and it encompasses a lot of ice. And uh, the three poles are South Pole, North Pole, well geographical. South Pole, geographical North Pole, and Everest. Mm. And Everest I've was already in the bag before I. Yeah, so technically, then was grouped into the the pole groups. So. Yes. Okay, and then you uh, you rode from Australia to the Maldives as well. No, to no. well, to, Mo- to Mauritius. To Mauritius, sorry, to can Mauritius. You, can you tell me about that? Because that is the was most that the most satisfying one? Because that, that like I questioned your your yeah. sanity on that one. Y- you're you're absolutely right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Even okay. I questioned okay. this. <laughs> I actually question my sanity more than once. I'm actually writing a book about it now. We already have a documentary which was filmed by one of my crewmates, T- uh, Stuart. We were three on board. But you're right. This was uh, the most F difficult, the most F dangerous. You can say fuck, Max. <laughs> the <laughs> most. <laughs> um, yes, um, it was crazy. It was more the most uh, what was the preparation? Where did the idea even come from for something like that? You were rowing, you know, even sailing, just rowing. Of course not sailing. No sail, no <laughs> engine. And at one point <laughs> in, in the middle of the voyage, you know, we have something called an AIS, um, automatic identification uh, system for ships. So when, when a big ship shows on our AIS, we have to contact them and ask them. So I asked one of the ships to divert their course because we were on a collision course. And he can see that we are only, unlike him, 200 meters long and God knows how many tons, uh, that we're only eight and a half meters long. And uh, and he goes, why don't you divert? And I go, well, because we're under manpower. And he goes, what do you mean? I goes, we're rowing. And he goes, you mean y- y- you don't have an engine? And I go, no, no, no engine, no sails. And he goes, well, let me repeat that. That's the captain of a big <laughs> ship. He goes, let me repeat that. You have no engine, you have no sails, you're on an eight and a half meter boat and you're rowing. And I said, affirmative. <laughs> he said, what the F are you doing here? <laughs> he was right. That was a good question. Of course yeah. he was right. He was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, listen, this, in answer to your question, it was 2007. I was training for the North Pole, which happened in 2009. Uh, in Scotland at Loch Tay, it was an SAS type training where they try and break you and all that. And uh, alongside us was uh, uh, this team who was training to row across the Atlantic. And uh, the idea of rowing across an ocean was you know, yeah, planted r- in my mind then. And then something happened with their captain who kind of challenged me. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. So... Uh, my eyes were set on 90 degrees north at the time, mm-hmm. the North Pole. But once w- that was achieved, I wasn't going to lay back. So I went after Let's that. Take that it took th- another three years. And gosh, we d- really did make it. And um, someone helped us along the way. I don't know how. Someone without help, because otherwise the Ocean Rowing Society, if you're given a biscuit along the way, they don't recognize your crossing. I said someone, may s- uh, someone from above, whatever mm. God you believe in or whatever. We had a host of problems, which I'm writing about in a book now. Uh, but we did make it, and we achieved three Guinness World Records, including I the that, yeah. fastest row uh, across H- the Indian how Ocean. How long did it take? It took 57 days, 15 hours, and 49 minutes. On and a boat, man. Yeah, what are we took food for 90 days, so there was, there was a... It was a big and that added, I'm sure that added quite a bit to the weight of the, of, of the boat as well. <laughs> yes, no? but food. I well, know, no, I know, <laughs> but... Well, uh, on a boat, uh, Ryan, as you know, there's good weight and there's bad weight. If you put the weight below deck in the middle, that's, that's, that creates ballast, which is good weight. So it prevents your boat from capsizing. Oh. If, um, but our dehy food, which was very voluminous, uh, is not heavy because it's dehydrated. We put the chocolate in the, um, in the center hatches. And uh, before a storm... We would uh, empty the sem- center hatches and fill them up with seawater f- to act as ballast. Oh. 
Mm. But to come back to your weight thing, we're supposed to take 9,000 calories per person per day, but I wasn't able to fit them on the boat. Big mistake, because I, I underestimated the, um, or overestimated the size of the hatches below deck. So we finally um, took only 5,500 calories per person per day. But that was for 90 days, the fact that we were able to finish in 57 days. And we knew it from halfway onwards, we were able to tap into the next day's supplies no, and eat more chocolate than <laughs> I've ever eaten <laughs> in my Which should be life. the moral of any story, uh, <laughs> essentially, to eat more chocolate than, than, than you've ever eaten. And do you think that was your greatest yeah, feat, your greatest achievement? Most difficult. Because to me, to 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 most yeah. difficult, yes. Yeah. Greatest, I don't greatest, know. Yeah, it's I don't know. No. Um, you might have had no, a better experience yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. I don't know. Like the greatest achievement would be if I was to convince others, and especially the youth of this country, who are going so through such a hard time. That, you know, I climbed my seven summits while Lebanon was at war. I could have laid back and say, you know, nobody's helping, or there are no opportunities, or whatever, or whatever. But. I believe we all have something inside, someone, something, and it would be a shame to live our life without doing our level best to bring out all the music that resides inside us and, 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 and sing it rather than keep it inside and die with, 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 um, with all of it inside. And that's so interesting that you, were, you touched upon like the youth of Lebanon, and I'm just going to go even deeper and say international youth because... Right now, with the coronavirus pandemic, as we all know, people are forced to stay in and like not mingle as much as they used to. And because of that, people, like especially younger younger kids, are becoming more drawn towards electronics and gadgets and technology. So the way that I looked at it, especially during the lockdown here, I saw two different, two extreme situations. The first situation was where people, okay, we can't go out clubbing, restaurants, bars, started to interact with nature, started to go on more hikes or camping adventures. But then the other extreme was, as I said, people started watching more TV, people started becoming lazier. And do you think the way that the world is heading in right now with a lot of technology being in, like being implicated into our daily lives, do you think that that might affect kids' like just raw interest in going out and exploring the world from, exploring the world from a more natural perspective? That's a good question. Listen, who am I to comment on all of this? But if I was to give my, 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 my honest thoughts and advice, technology is definitely a double-edged sword. Without technology, I could, I could not have achieved what I've achieved, okay? Because it is amazing the world of information you have at your fingertips. And we're not going to go there, but some people m think that you know, education is, is obsolete because you have everything at your... F why should you memorize whatever it is you, they're getting to you to memorize if you can have it at your fingertips? Yes. An interesting thought uh, came to my mind because I remember we had the people from Robocom. They're, do, they're pioneering virtual like reality virtual company. reality co One of the biggest virtual reality companies in the world and maybe the biggest one in the Middle East. And a thought came to my mind, like, because now we're going more towards technology that instead of people wanting to hike and actually, let's say, like, go on a cl climb a mountain they could have a virtual experience of that, putting on a headgear. And feeling like they're And feeling as if they're on, yeah, ex mm. as if hopefully they're... Hopefully that will incite them to go and do the real thing. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> or hopefully it wouldn't. I don't know, I don't know that if that's how it works, Maxime. I hope yeah. that's how it works. Because we got really into do. a huge debate with them as well about technology, the pros and cons yeah, about About technology. regulation. I think yeah. that's what the whole point of it was. Uh, but not getting into that, um, I wanted to ask, because you, you touched on Lebanese youth, and I had a hypothetical question for you. Obviously, you've had this amazing career and you've done these amazing achievements and, and you know, you're, you're recognized in your country and you're beloved in your country. Would you have traded it in to do all the feats you've done, but to be residing elsewhere? So in a US or a UK, you're still Lebanese in this scenario, but your platform is bigger. You know, the sponsors are bigger. The, 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 the power is yeah. bigger. Or would you not have that scenario and still like to be in Lebanon? Did you think of this question once? I did. Gosh, it's a very good one. And uh, in French, we say, tu m'en colles une. Um, I'd have to really close my eyes and think about this. Uh, perhaps my answer would be to allow myself, or if you'll allow me to answer this one, 
sometime in the future when oh, maybe tomorrow? I'll know whether <laughs> I've achieved, huh? Tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Want to come back? Ten minutes? <laughs> um, it's a very good question, definitely. Well, listen, for sure, I never did this to get any anything from the private, the, 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 the public sector. I did not expect anything. And that is why, as you know, I went to the private sector for sponsorships. My sponsorships were enough to fuel my adventure and keep the family, you know, uh, from starving. Um, never in my wildest dreams did I, first of all, imagine that I would succeed so many times and so well. Two, that I, w I, I, I like I said, I never expected anything from <coughs> my government and so anything that came from the government was great now don't misunderstand me no finances whatsoever came from the government <laughs> well, i'm not surprised however, but they like to take pictures with you <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> however uh, my photo does appear on a on a postal stamp a big commemorative 15 by 10 centimeter postal stamp and also on a fiscal stamp there are calling cards i'm uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a knight and an officer of the Order of the National Cedar. So I was given recognition by some of our leaders. And I really uh, res respect them and for that. Mm -hmm. those, those, those very few leaders, very few, very, very few. Now others, I, I definitely won't mention names, were totally oblivious to the whole thing and never understood it and not only that looked down upon how could this guy who's not a politician uh, draw attention from everyone because from all walks of life as you know in in the lebanon where there are many factions i have respect and that's that's amazing i never never in my wildest dreams would have thought this would would lead to this but because i'm apolitical and People don't even know what my religion is, which is a big thing in Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, uh, and because I've achieved something in the name of Lebanon and Lebanon alone, perhaps those people, and I guess righteously so, uh, uh, respect me. Mm. Because to the community, I think you're super valued. Yani. You're, you're essentially, you know, you're a big name in Lebanon and the things you've done and you've always carried the Lebanese flag when you've, when you've on the adventures you've, you've gone on. So I think with us, with our friends, with inspire our parents, our generation. You've inspired even our generation, generation as well. We, you know, you're, you're a very big figure, but do you think there is a bit of being undervalued in, I don't want to say the political structure, but kind of by the people that run this country? Because what you've done has been unbelievable. Fuck Who cares? Em. Who cares? Fuck yeah. them. But I'll tell you something. <laughs> No, well, actually, yes. Yeah, uh, kind in of. Fact, yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> because it is un. I mean, I, we don't want to go there. I know we mm. don't want to go there, <laughs> but I find it unthinkable that after all that's happened, nothing seems to have changed. And I don't want to go into the details, but my God, I mean, it's time for us to wake up, change. Yeah, mm. wake up and change things so that we can at least live in a decent place. But let me tell you something. Um, I think you did not know 100% what Everesting was two weeks ago. Now, Everesting sure. is a concept where you pick any hill anywhere in the world and you ride up and down that same hill the required number of times so that the total positive ascent equals the height of Everest. Now, having climbed Everest and being a biker, the idea was bound to draw my attention. And I wrote to Everesting.com um, and like five minutes later, I get a call from this guy called Andy in Australia, and he is the founder of Everesting. And I, we spoke for two hours, okay? And then I said to him, Andy, I mean, I don't understand it. I mean, every time somebody writes to you, and there are so many now who've, 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 who are on the Everesting uh, Wall of Fame, um, do, you, do, you, do you call them and speak to them? And he said, no, 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 no. I Googled you, Max, and we, we, I mean, it's a, uh, he, and now we've become very, very good friends, and I might go there, he might come, and we're going on to something bigger than everything. So you're saying, uh, but people, actually, I'm, I, we don't know of anyone who is, I hate to talk about this, but who, now I, I, I because the people from uh, Adventure Stats wrote to me a year back and said, Max, do you realize you're the only one who's done the seven summits? the two poles or three poles, whatever, and who have rowed across an ocean. Usually these are three different people. 
But there's only one bozo on the planet them into one, yeah. who's decided to do all of these. But it must be something wrong with him. But <laughs> <laughs> like too big, man. <laughs> <laughs> to be debated, yeah. To be Why? debated. Why? Why? Yeah. You're taking their jobs, man. <laughs> to be debated. Well, I, I I I hope I've inspired people, but not to climb mountains. When I when at schools they ask me about climbing, I tell them I'm not here to talk to you about climbing. I'm here to talk to you about what you can achieve if you put your mind to it. Period. Okay. Me, I was drawn towards the mountain or the the, the open air or the adventure, and it's true that I. I, I was able to evolve and change and do other things. I mean, how can a mountain climber go and row an ocean? It's just it seems so all surreal. comes back to my original idea. When there's a will, there's a way. And you can achieve anything you put your mind to. But you really have to put your mind to. You cannot you know, keep doing things the way you were doing them or not um, uh, accept the sacrifices to achieve um, whatever goals you set yourself. Yeah, and I, I, when, when you do, because I remember you came to our school, this was probably 10, 12 years ago. What school? ACS. ACS. Yeah. Yes. I think you went to you ACS. Were you yeah. came there? I was there, yeah. yeah. I was the guy like, I know Maxima. Yeah, yeah, I know him. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's a, he's a friend came, of the family. And you came to ICS. You came to ICS. Well. I've I've seen, yeah. I saw you in Ein Ar. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah, you in Ras yeah, yeah. Beirut as well. Ago, Twice yeah, yeah, you came yeah. give speeches. Yep. I remember. You I don't remember. I think Kilimanjaro, you came to ICS and you spoke about your experiences climbing Kilimanjaro. And you were showing, we were in the auditorium and you were showing videos. Mm-hmm. It was probably after Everest, so Kilimanjaro yeah. was, was way before that. But tell me, so you remember? Yeah, and I and I remember you came and 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 you gave this you know this very motivational, amazing speech. And obviously, as kids, I think we were in middle school back then. As middle school kids, to be completely honest with you, of course, there was probably forty percent were completely turned off on their phones, just wanting <laughs> to go out to recess and and be social and everything. Which is normal. Which is completely normal, obviously. But there was a very large portion of people who were like okay, shit, this makes me want to, I want to go out and do something. I want to achieve something. And I just want to know, do you know any personal accounts of people who've done things and said, thank you, Max, because without you talking, without you giving me, you know, your your advice, I don't think I could have done what I did. Yeah, yeah, this is amazing. And it brings so much joy to me when people come to and tell me that. there's even, um, well, yeah, there are many, and I don't need to name them, but uh, some have were really, really inspired and have gone and achieved their summit, whatever that was or is or, or may be, um, simply because uh, they saw that, you know, this little kid from Lebanon during the war went and uh, achieved his goals despite everything that's going on ar- around mm. him or them. Mm. And to, to pick your psyche a bit, because this is something I've uh, I've always wondered because I've known you for quite a while. Are you ever going to wake up one day and not have not have that goal to achieve, not have that summit to conquer, not have that? Are you just going to wake up one day and be like, no, I'm content? And or is there always going to be that challenge? I don't know. I don't know. But it's still it still is now. And it's not normal for someone my age to wake up tomorrow before dawn and start cycling at dawn for nine hours. It's like not normal for someone my age. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 not it's not normal in general. It could be normal for someone, but it's not normal for someone. It definitely stems from the lack of having um, having been able to express myself through sports when I should have done that, which is, which is when I was your age or even before. Um, th- there's a bug that stayed inside me, like I'm writing in my book, which... Uh, which I have not been able to overcome, and it's just still in there. It is not normal. I mean, I'm it's not. It's unbelievable. It's uh, it's almost it's almost yeah. un- it honestly it honestly is almost <laughs> unbelievable. I feel like you try we to, to dissect fi- you, Mark. Yeah. I feel like you try to find that challenge. Like you want somebody to challenge you to do that. Like as it's you. It's hard to live without yeah. a summit in mind. Yeah, mm. and you'll a create summit something. Meaning a challenge. Mm. Like and the tougher the challenge, the more satisfaction I get out of it. Do you think you have to set these summits? Then do you ha- you have to set these challenges. Without it, you'd be a bit kind of lost for sure now yes until now yes hopefully someday no yeah. because yeah um, as you said like you'd go up the mountains you finish the mountains you'd row or you'd cycle and then you might find something new within the next few years that somebody might challenge you on or you might think of it in a creative sense it's not about people challenging me but it's i still enjoy setting myself setting a, goals a, a seemingly unattainable goal mm. and working hard towards making it happen mm. so you think because uh, i can ha- i have this picture of you when you're 75 
still you know wanting to swim across oceans <laughs> and, and trek across swimming deserts across, and swimming and across the ocean that's uh have you been able to yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> please don't ask him i think he's gonna do it i think we've, like, we've unknowingly challenged him to do it <laughs> mediterranean sea yes, like right for sure. so yeah he's no, planning it now <laughs> like, so, oh, so you wait. think we should all i mean not to your level let's be swim realistic here oceans. no not swim across <laughs> oceans we should all set these quote unquote unattainable challenges because work that's them. something you know that's something that kind of breathes life into you i think so yes but uh, let's make it clear i mean you have to know what it is you're passionate about you're not going to set yourself something which because it's pointless and probably you will not achieve it you have to be if find out what it is you're really passionate about and then do your level best to you know be your best at it it would be a shame to waste a lifetime not not having genuinely tried to do this you have so you have the book that you got to us so generously thank you yeah. which i will read tonight actually tonight? and you said you once yes. it signed well, well. It, takes, it doesn't take long yeah well because I, I love co- i love comic books but uh, you said you have another one coming yeah no should we plug it when is it coming out this one is kilimanjaro which is the first mountain okay, I climbed, nice. where i discovered the high mountain yeah. and where i challenged myself to attempt to climb the seven summits the next one is aconcagua and denali uh, grouped together it's by the same artist Tony Abu Jaudeh, who's uh, who's done an amazing job. And the second one, it's even uh, a lot better than this. Um, even better oh than these this. are nice. Um, and um, yeah, go there. This is to like Fauda 2020. Yes, exactly. We're well, honored. My best honored. wishes from the summit of Kilimanjaro. <laughs> We're honored. In the hope that you too will achieve all your craziest. We're honored. Dreams. Bless. We're honored. And <laughs> from the best wishes from us, from you know, a comfy apartment, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so thank much. You so thank much. you so thank much. You much. It was a pleasure guys. talking to you and it's really inspirational. Maxime, you're a legend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Uh,